Glad to be here with you all today. Share a couple things with you. I'm old. I'm emotional. Deal with it. <laughs> okay? It is what it is. Okay? So if I cry, you know, it's life. Um, today's a difficult day. We spent three days celebrating the home going of my sister. Wonderful stories, wonderful to hear things about how God used her. So that kind of makes things challenging. But I'll be honest with you, today's sermon is difficult for me because it's about me. Points in me. You see, God began, uh, I had no idea that I was going to be doing this till a few weeks ago. And through studying and reading some books and things, God had been showing me some things and putting some conviction in my life about, about me. And that makes it more difficult when it's personal. But I want to share some things with you today. I, I'm going to be honest with you. Some of you that are, can go back in the day, you're going to feel a little bit like the old sword drills. We're going to, we're going to run through a lot of scriptures, so you may not, don't worry about keeping up. I'll, I'll read them to you. Um, but it, it was, I love the, the story. Fits so well this morning. You know, it, it's the, God's words are foundation. And that's where the truth is. So see, it really doesn't matter what I have to say. It doesn't make any difference with the opinions I have. What matters is what God's word says. I heard Tony Evans say, he said, uh, he said, God's word is sharp as a two-edged sword. A and he said, when the word is preached, we will always be cut. Let me tell you, when you prepare, you are cut. So, John 8, 32 says this, and you shall know the truth. And what is it? And the truth shall set you free. The truth. Well, we're here again. We're looking for a new preacher. You know? And, and we ask a lot of the same questions. You know? And people have a lot of comments and they have their own ideas about things. And they say, well, you know what? You know, okay, so what do we have to do to be the kind of church God wants? Every church does that in this time frame. They begin to ask themselves the questions. And some say, well, if we had this kind of preacher, if he would preach this way, if he would preach this way. And they say, well, you know what? If we would, if we would have a preacher that would have us do music this way, or we have music do it this way, or if we'd have new programs that would get this age group, or this age group, or this age group, or you know what? If we would change some things in our facilities, if we would build different stuff, if, if we, and we can go on and on and on and on. And it all comes down and says, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to be the church of God? Let me tell you what, it has nothing to do with the pastor. It has nothing to do with the staff. It has nothing to do with programming. It has nothing to do with the building. It has everything to do with me and you. You see, we are the church. So you see, when we, we hear someone say, well, you know, Campbellsville Baptist isn't doing so much, or you say, you know what, we're not doing what we ought to do. Guess who we is? We is us. We is us. It's us. You see, God says for us to be the church he wants us to be, it depends upon us. I want today to be a, a time of self-examination. Lamentations 3.40 says this, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. And do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? You see, we need to take a strong, hard look at ourselves today, individually, and evaluate where we are in our relationship and in fellowship with Jesus Christ. I encourage you today to listen and take a hard look. Don't look for anybody else. Don't look at anybody else. Because, see, it begins with us. It begins when we take an honest look before God. 
and say, God, show me the truth so that I can be set free. Turn with me, if you would, to Mark 8, verse 34 through 38. That's kind of going to be where we're going to be for most of the day. Well, not really a day, just the 30 minutes. I'm just kidding with you. Um, it says, when he called the people to him with his disciples, he said to them, whosoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. First of all, we see it says whosoever. It can be all of us. It's for any of us to be a follower. But, but I looked at some different um, uh, translations and things and how they, they said that first part of who shall be, be a follower and said some different things like this. Um, it said, whosoever desires to come after me, whoever wants to be my disciple, if anyone wants to be a follower, any who wants to come after me, if any man will come after me, or some others that I had read, sold out. Or if I want to be all in. Or if I want to be a real believer. You see, the first thing he says is to deny yourself. Now, I have been on a diet for almost a month. And I'm denying myself some stuff. Now, see, this isn't the same deny. Because as soon as Thursday comes and my official month of doing this thing is over and then I get back to kind of a real life of eating better, there are some things I'm going to eat. Now, I denied it earlier, but it doesn't take long I'm going back. That's not what he's talking about here. Denying self is simply this. Yes to Jesus, no to you. Yes to Jesus and no to you. Once you look at, at 35 and 36, I'm going to read real quick again. Whoever desires to save his own life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I want to read just very quickly a, a portion from Deion Sanders' book. Many of you know, remember Deion Sanders was a star at Florida State, prime time. Went on to play in the NFL, went on to uh, uh, play in the Major League Baseball, star player in both. Had everything. Here's what he says. There I was driving 70 miles an hour down the highway, just looking for a place to end it all. Finally, I yanked the wheel to one side and pulled my car off the road. It skidded to a stop in loose gravel, sending up a cloud of dust. I hesitated for more than a second, built up my nerve, and put the accelerator to the floor and shot over the edge of the cliff. How had I become so low in my life? Deion Sanders, prime time, million dollar athlete and all that. I've wondered many times that since that faithful day what really brought me to that point. How could I have made it to the top of my game in both baseball and football with so much success, so much money, so much fame, with commercials, endorsements, with my face all over them running on every channel during the season and then drive off a cliff like that? What happened to me? I had just finished the best season of my career. Everything I touched turned to gold, but inside I was broken and totally defeated. I remember sitting at the back of the practice field one afternoon, away from everybody, tears running down my face, and I was saying to myself, this is so meaningless. I'm so unhappy. We're winning every week, and I'm playing great, but I'm not happy. I tried everything, parties, women, buying expensive jewelry and gadgets, and nothing helped. There was no peace. I had everything the world had to offer, but no peace, no joy, just emptiness inside. The Bible describes in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes as chasing after the wind, and that's exactly what I was like. I tried to buy myself something to make me happy, and I was even emptier than before because I could not see that nothing could possibly satisfy the hunger deep down inside of me. 
All I could do was stay busy, occupy my time, doing whatever I could to keep busy so the feelings of emptiness would not come and haunt me. The pain was horrible. None of the success on the field could could prepare me for the crisis in my life that led to suicide attempt. When I took that deadly plunge, I had reached the end of my rope. I was struggling with just everything in my life. I realize now that God had to get me to a point where he could do what he wanted to do with me. And that meant first he had to strip me of all my comforts, all my success, all the relationships I had depended on. Through the struggles, through the doubts, through the bitterness, he was bringing me to the point where I could see his hand in my life. On the fateful day in 1997, I swerved off the road, slammed my foot down the accelerator. The car just shot up like a rocket. By all rights, it should have flipped and turned over and nosedived. It didn't happen. When I hit the bottom, the car started sliding awkwardly, rocking back and forth until I came down hard and slid in the bottom of the hill. Miraculously, I walked away without a scratch. Then God started to send people into my life to share the truth with me. Friends, former teammates, pastors, and my attorney. Late one night, I opened the Bible to a passage that said, if you confess with your heart, Lord Jesus Christ, and be- with your mouth, Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. The words hit me like a ton of bricks, like they were meant for me. At that moment, I put my trust in Jesus and asked him into my life. Before I found Christ, I had material comforts and all the money and all the fame and popularity. I had no peace. When I found Christ, I found what I was missing all these years. Only then was I able to trust God's will for my life. I have a new sense of peace about what happens on and off the field. I have a passion, a hunger for things of God, and every day I'm feeding on his word. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I had everything that money, power, and sex could give, but it wasn't enough. It didn't satisfy me. I was empty and desperately empty. Success almost ruined my life, but thank God it came to him in the nick of time. And that made the difference. A man that had everything, had it all. Other men would die just to be like Dion. Jerseys were sold, be like Dion. That that was, you wanted, people wanted to be like prime time. On the outside. And he was empty. When he finally came to the place to understand what it meant to deny himself, to turn everything over to Jesus, to say, I want you completely in control of my life. Was his life changed? Now, here's a sad point. Many of us have a theology somewhere in our brain that we can invite part of Jesus into our lives. If I ask you to raise your hand if you wanted to go to heaven, I would dare say everybody would raise their hand. Most people would. They want to go to heaven. But I want you to understand something. Jesus does not sell fire insurance. He says, you follow me. You follow me. You give me all of your life. You don't give part of your life in a host that you will sneak into heaven. He says, you give all to me. Everything you look through Scripture talks about Jesus saying what? Come follow me. Come follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. You see, some people just think if I believe There's a God. If I believe what Jesus did, if I just believe that, the Bible says even the demons of hell believe and tremble. Intellectual assent is not enough. To just say that I believe in my head, I have to believe in my heart. You see, all through Scripture, all through Scripture, when a person encountered Jesus, what happened? His life was what changed you don't meet jesus and remain the same when you truly meet jesus your life is changed peter john fisherman (laughs) pretty good fishing business jesus said come follow me what they do left it and came on matthew tax collector pretty good tax business made a lot of money Jesus said, come on, follow me. What did he do? He followed. Paul left a powerful, you know, religious sect where he was a big dog to follow Jesus. 
You see, he wants us to commit everything, not just some things. You see, denying ourselves is turning everything over to him, nothing held back. And this is the part that drove many people away. You see, we have somehow not talked about the cost. The cost. You see, the cost of following Jesus is everything. We give our life. We commit it to follow him. And you see, when, it was interesting when, when Jesus preached, there were many that came, but what did many of them do? Also, out the back door. They said, hey, I'm not in for that. I'm not in for all that cost. If we're going to deny ourselves, Acts 16, 31 says this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Luke 13, 3 says, unless you repent with all your heart, likewise you will perish. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Acts 3, 19 says, repent, then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come to you. When Jesus preached, many left. If we are sharing the gospel, if we are going to truthfully share the gospel, we need to tell people how much God loves them and the plan that he has for them and the cost of following Jesus. The second thing we look at is he said, take up his cross. Notice he didn't say what? Take up my cross. We somehow have this idea that we're supposed to put this cross on our back and walk around and be miserable and feel awful and, oh, I've got my cross. Y'all feel sorry for me. He says, no, he said, I want you to pick up my cross. What, What does it mean? The cross in Roman times meant death and humiliation. The worst kind of death you could ever see. And here's the part. On that side of that day at the cross, it was awful. But guess what? On this side of the cross, it means what? Victory. This side of the cross, the meaning is different. Because you see, when when, when he went to the cross and died for us, he paid the price for all of our sins so that we could be free. So that we could have that, as we sing, victory in Jesus. Every day, we need to pick up his cross. So so what does it mean? I started thinking about it, and, and for me, I started thinking, you know, if it's not death, it's victory. You see, when, when, when I made the decision to follow Jesus, I denied myself, and, it says, and, 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 I'm, and I'm dying of death, he says, but guess, but I'm picking up his life. And the life that he is and he all, can, all that he can be. And so one of the verses that came to my mind was Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Daily. Daily. Picking up the cross is a daily decision. It's a daily thing where I get up and I say today, today I want to seek him. Because I want to be like him. I want to know what he wants in my life. I, I, want to, I want to long to follow him. I want to do what he wants me to do. And know that, and my favorite part, everything else be taken care of. Is that not the simplest verse in the world that we struggle with? We're worrying right now about things in our life that he says, would you quit worrying about and follow me first and I got it covered? He said, I got you back. I got you. Follow me. Trust me, I'll take care of that. But what do we do? God, let's not get to you in a minute, but I got to fix this. I got to go take care of this problem. And I got to do this. And God, 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 God just shaking his head going, listen, I've tried to make this simple for you. Seek ye first, not second, not third, not when I have time. He said, seek first the kingdom. And what? All, not some, he said, and all these things shall be added unto you. I will take care of you. So how do, how do we seek God? 
We put him first in everything. We have a hunger. Mark Betterson says this, I love it. He said, if you don't have a hunger for God, you're full of yourself. If you don't have a hunger for God, you're full of yourself. And that's sad, that's where many of us are. We're full of ourselves. We seek God by spending time in prayer, reading his word, meditating on his word, worshiping individually, worshiping cor corporately, listening to God, spending time with God. I've got some sad news for you people. I know this will break your heart. If you think, listen to me, if you think spending 60 minutes on Sunday morning and I'm going to be nice in 60 more in Sunday school is going to take care of all you need for a week. You've just believed a lie out of the pit of hell. This is not going to get it done for you. This is part of what happens. This is part of it. But this has to be a daily thing to pick up his cross daily to walk with him. It has to happen every single day. The third thing is this. He says, follow me. I, I'm sorry, but I used to love the game, follow the leader. You ever play that? Now, what happens in follow the leader? What do we do? We do what the leader does. We follow just what the leader does. John 5, 19 says this. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son does. You see, Jesus did what the father did. So what do we need to do? We do what Jesus did. We do what Jesus did. So how do we know? How do we know? We know it by being in his word. Now we're gonna go through struggles. We go through struggles. But he says, what if we seek him, I'm going to be there to walk through you with the struggles. And we're going to fail. We're going to fail. I stand here as a failed, flawed person. And I don't have all the answers. God does. We are going to fall, even as we try to follow. But he says, I am there for you. I am there to take care of you. You see, our actions and our attitudes should reflect us following Jesus. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. The world determines their definition of what it means to be a follower of Christ by our actions and reactions. That's how they define it. And we look and we hear people say, well, that's what a Christian is. That's what a follower of Jesus. You go, well, no, it's not. You know why they have that definition? Because that is what they get to see from some people. It is important that they see Jesus Christ living in our lives. Verse 38 says this, for whoever is ashamed of me in my words and is adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when it comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Right now, we've got people from our church in Michigan and Cuba sharing God's love, telling people about how their lives can be changed. That's what the world needs to see. Now, hang with me on this one. This may be a little hard, but I'm going to tell you. At the funeral the other day, one of the things is, is I got to talk to a girl who Susan was her Sunday school teacher, another lady. And the two teachers used to talk about every day like, we got to quit. This one girl's driving us nuts. Just, we've got to quit. And Susan says, oh, we've got to stay in there. And this girl said, every time he saw Susan, she would firmly, lovingly love her care for her though she was a pain at 17 years old she became pregnant susan threw her a shower kept loving her kept loving her 
finally the girl came to Christ. She now is helping do music in her church. See, that's God's love. That's God's love expressed, and that's what he said he wants. If we're going to follow him, we have to allow his love to come out and be seen in other people's lives. Let them see us. There was a, another family that was at the funeral home the same time we were. Um, one of our valiant military men had died in Afghanistan. And uh, we were there and his wife had had three small girls. Robbie Lynn and, and my sister, Sherry and Jan, a couple women, saw these girls sitting in the room where you normally have food and there was nothing in there. And they all said, we have plenty. We have plenty. Let, let's, let's share with them. So they took the food in them with their, and, and uh, Robbie Lynn says, you know, we want to pray for you. Because you see, I'm here with my aunt, and she loved children. But she loved Jesus more. And she'd want you to know that she loves you and we love you. But Jesus loves you most. That's what it's about. That's what about we that have so much. We that have more than we could ever imagine reaching out to people that don't have. To say, let me show you how much God loves you. Because God loves me. That's what it means to follow Jesus. To reach out, to love those people. But not just to meet those needs, but to tell them, you know what? God loves you so much. He sent his son to die on a cross for you. That's what it means to daily follow Jesus. You see, that same gospel that you heard that brought you to be a follower is the same gospel you must share with somebody else. People are dying and going to hell around us every day. One last story about Susan. Before we left a mission trip in Florida, she had gone to a funeral home. A teacher friend, spouse had passed away. The spouse was a proclaimed atheist. And Susan came in and sat right down next to me and told me. And she broke down in tears and said, oh, Robbie, he's in hell. He's in hell. Here's what I ask you. When's the last time the thought of a lost friend of yours being in hell broke your heart? It breaks the heart of Jesus. He says it's not his will that any should perish. You see, if we had that heart, if we had that heart for lost people that Jesus said, if we're going to be a follower, he says, you need to have this heart, the heart that says, I care about these people and I want to know where they're going to spend eternity. It'd make a difference in all that we would do. So now there it is. So what? So what? I would never try to tell you how to examine yourself. I can't examine you. I just want you to hear the truth so that God can lead you through that examination. One of the things we have to understand, sin is what blocks everything up in our life. Specific sins in our lives are stopping you from being what God wants you to be. And we need to deal with sin. One of the failures I think we have so many cases is just that, that we just, we don't want to deal with it. There's sin in our life. There's sin in the life of Robbie Spear that I have to deal with if I'm going to be what God wants me to be. So now, here's where I see it. Here's how we fall. 
There's some of you here that have chosen to be followers of Christ. And you are trying to seek him daily. You're walking in trust. You're walking in faith. You know you're going to stumble. You know you're going to fall. You know you're going to fail. But you're trusting him in all this. Daily seeking his direction and the strength for your life. If you honestly can say that's where I'm at, God bless you. Keep walking. Keep walking. Don't get proud of your walk. Don't get proud of your walk because it's not about you. It's about Jesus. Maybe a follower here, but you're not walking in a manner that would please God. And the Holy Spirit is convicting you of things in your life, specific things. You're battling it. It's tough. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. Now, we think of that as a salvation verse. But it was really written to a church in Laodicea that was lukewarm. Believers that were not where they needed to be. And he said, you know what? If you'll let me rekindle this fellowship. Rekindle it. I have something for you. He wants to have that intimate relationship with you more and more. But we have to repent of our sins. I've been Southern Baptist all my life. All my life I've been Southern Baptist. And, and, and you know, when times the Lord would work on me, well, I, I'd come forward and rededicate my life. And, and you know what one of the problems was, though? I'd come rededicate, but I wouldn't deal with my sin. So I'd just come rededicate because I'd say, God, I want to do better. I want to do better. But here's what God says. He says, before you rededicate, let's take care of the sin issue. Let's take care of what's causing the problem. Then you can rededicate. We, we try to rededicate something, and we still have the same issues we're not dealing with. He says, deal with the sin in our life. Come before me. Confess this sin. Deal with it. Then we can move on. Third, you're a professed follower of Christ, but you are not walking in any manner that'd be pleasing to God. And you're not convicted at all. You think you're going to get in by the skin of your teeth. I'm going to encourage you to take a big, hard look. Take a real look. Last, you may be here tonight, this afternoon, this morning, and you've never made a decision to be a follower of Christ. You heard the difference in Deion Sanders' testimony. Countless number of people here could tell you the difference Jesus makes in your life, and that's what matters. He is the answer. And we seek him. It does matter. I want to close with this. Three things I want to share with you, and these are real. Matthew 7, 20 says this. By your fruits, you will know them. The only way I know there's an apple tree is I see apples. If there is no fruit, we must ask why. Second thing, I want you to look at Matthew the seventh chapter, 21 to 23, it says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to him, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I was going to tell you something. Those are church people. And they're church people in charge of stuff because they was doing stuff. We're not talking about it just even somebody that just comes sometime or those are not here. We're talking about somebody that was active. It says there's going to be a time that people who were active in the church that thought they were doing everything right because they were here and doing this stuff, he's going to say, depart from me. I don't know who you are because we've never had that relationship with Jesus Christ. We played the game of follower. We played the game, but we would never followed him. We're following ourselves. Parable in, tw in Matthew 25 is the parable of the servant. 
You see, what our desire is, what my desire is more than anything else, is I want to stand before God and him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. As a follower of Christ, those are the words we want to hear from him. From him, well done. The question I'm going to ask you today, what are you going to hear from him? What will you hear? I encourage you today, don't leave today without dealing with this. But I know, I know, many will walk away. Many will walk away and say, "Mm, not interested in that. How sad. Father, we come to you right now. We have no clue how you're working in our hearts, but we know that you're working. We know that we need to fall before you. Father, I just pray you forgive where I failed you. Lord, I pray that you'll forgive me and just give me the strength to walk the way I need to walk. That God, I can be what you want me to be. I pray for everyone here. Lord, I know that you're working in hearts and I pray, God, that you will convict and today will respond. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen.